Morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Dr. Garayas, Bio 112, ECPI University, and this is Chapter uh, 11. Um, I believe we, uh, probably by the time we see this, uh, we had a lecture on the nervous system, the first lecture, and this is the continuation of that lecture. I believe we already had this lecture already. Uh, just note some of the uh, medical terms. Um, you are responsible for them for lab. Uh, I will, um, uh, I will add uh, more of these terms um, on announcements. And remember, the announcements for lab are in lab. So we already talked about this also in um, uh, in lecture. We talked about the meninges or the covering. There are three levels of covering. If we look at it, you have the outer tough layer, which is your dura mater, right? Dura, durable. Mater, meaning mother, or the thing that's going to protect uh, your brain. It's a tough mother. Your arachnoid matter, which is the middle layer that's uh, web-like and contains cerebrospinal fluid. And the pia mater, or pia mater, right, which is uh, the most uh, closest part to your brain, and that part has um, your, uh, a lot of your blood vessels that feed your cerebrum, okay? Eh, partitions of the dura matter, nice to know, not too important. What's important is know the layers, what's in it, which one has cerebral spinal fluid, and remember, cerebrospinal fluid, very important to us because it is, uh, the, it's, like the, it's like the main communication. It brings nutrients in, it takes garbage out, and it's, uh, it, goes, it surrounds the brain and uh, the spinal cord, hence the term cerebrospinal fluid. It's located in these ventricles. You have, now, you don't have to memorize, you know, location and just know and understand what the ventricles are. The ventricles are, um, uh, they're storage facilities for the cerebrospinal fluid. And remember, your cerebrospinal fluid is uh, constantly circulating. And uh, it is also the location of, remember we talked about the ependymal cells. They're in something called your choroid plexus. And plexus just means like some sort of uh, 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 net or network. So there's a network of ependymal cells that line um, uh, the ventricles or these rooms. And you have a third, fourth, and uh, two lateral ventricles. And you can see how there's uh, connections in between them. Here's a nice picture of, it just shows like, you know, that cerebral spinal fluid does flow around uh, your brain, in and around your brain. So all the way down to your uh, uh, coccyx and sacrum. And that's why in the level of your lumbar vertebrae, we can stick a needle in there, uh, typically in between lumbar three and lumbar four. And uh, we can sample this fluid. And if we could sample this fluid, it could tell us uh, what's going on chemically in our brain and our spinal cord. That's, uh, typically, that's called a lumbar tap or a spinal tap. Okay, so we now know the ventricles are within our brain. There are four of them. They're interconnected. They form the cerebral spinal fluid. The ependymal cells are also in there. Uh, it goes as well. And, um, and the, the CSF must circulate. Now, brain development. Eh, not going to go to too much of this, but... Remember what we talked about, we have your uh, forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. And that's where this is coming, the proencephalon, mesencephalon, rhombencephalon. Nice to know, probably not a really good testable item. Here is an example of a lumbar tap. You could see you have the sterile needle, goes through here. We're trying to get in between um, the third and fourth uh, um, vertebrae of our lumbar, and here you go. It goes inside there, and we have to get through the dura mater and then go inside to the level of the 
arachnoid mater, right, uh, and to obtain this fluid. So we talked about the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain uh, um, uh, last lecture. Um, so it's better to what's uh, what's better. This is nice to know, but what's better to know is what we went through in laboratory yesterday. You need to know uh, the uh, the gyri and uh, sulcus. Gyri plural, sulci uh, plural, gyrus singular, sulcus singular. So what is the sulcus and gyri? Well, it goes, the sulcus, right, think sulking and sinking. So those are the, the grooves inside here. And the bumps, that's your gyrus. I recall that in laboratory we looked at this mid-sagittal view and we talked about the, uh, the regions, but these you will be responsible for. Thalamus, pineal gland, hypothalamus, uh, pituitary, right? And you know the pituitary has an anterior and posterior. We're going to learn that in uh, um, one of your last lectures. So you because you have then your midbrain area here, so this is all forebrain, then midbrain, and of course your spinal cord, think what, hindbrain. Midbrain, pons, a little bump here, and the medulla right before the spinal cord. And of course you need to know the location of your cerebellum. So this picture, golden. This is what's going to probably be on your automage table. I'm going to put pins, and you should be able to um, Look at them. Diagrammatically, I could also have this, a nice color picture. I can erase all of these, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And the two things you're going to need to know is location, frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital. Which one uh, goes, what are, uh, goes, or goes, what is re each region responsible for? And in general, frontal lobe is processing decision-making, judgment. Parietal lobe, think uh, your uh, motor area one, two, and three, and your sensory. Occipital lobe, think vision. Temporal lobe, think hearing. As basic as it gets. Okay, let's see if there, oh, here's a nice, uh, um, uh, nice diagram, which is uh, nice to learn. Um, now don't get this frontal eye field mixed up with what the occipital lobe does. Remember, visual recognition, recognition and actual processing what you see is back here. If I say frontal, I want you to think concentration, planning, problem solving. Um, no Broca's area, no Wernicke's, not for identification, but for what they do. Uh, we'll discuss that in a moment. Now, this is called the homunculus. Um, in the motor areas of your cortex, which is this part right here, uh, this part. So all of this is parietal, this pink, this yellow, and this green. But you have the motor, and then you have your sensory here. And then you have something called the homunculus, which is there's certain parts of the brain matched to certain things. And you could see how Salivation, vocalization, swallowing take up a big chunk. That's why this thing looks distorted, right? Your thumb and fingers are really important. But then your arms, trunk, and pelvis, and thigh, not as much as what? These things, which are, which in the representation of the motor area is pretty important. Sensory as well. You could see how lips are exaggerated here because they're, uh, they're very sensitive. And your uh, uh, fingers and thumbs, right? But the most sensitive areas, even though the uh, genitalia is uh, represented as a, as a small feature here, it's typically your lips, genitalia, and your fingers, and your, uh, your, your fingers, the tips of your fingers, because of course, that's the most sensitive sensory. And again, the motor area and the sensory area are all part of your parietal. And you can see they're very specific areas. And remember what we talked about in lecture, it makes common sense that they're together because they're, you know, they're, they're, they're complementary. I can't have any motor function without feeling things. 
and I can't feel things without uh, me motoring towards, uh, you know, to whatever I'm feeling. So those are the parts of the cerebrum. That's the uh, uh, forebrain. This is a lovely uh, summary for frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital. Now, um, we touched on memory in the last um, lecture that we, we talked about how memory is, we already talked about how we have short-term and long-term memory. We already talked also about how, um, how, do, you, how do you get long-term memory, and it's simply repetition. Um, and also, memory is stored in your brain it's, we're not quite sure where the exact location is, but it's definitely chemical and electrical, just the way your um, action potential is uh, moved and propagated. So if you do anything to your chemical, like you drink too much, could you black out and not remember stuff? Sure. If I zap you with a taser, could there be parts of that moment right before I zapped you with a taser, you'd have some issues? Uh, remembering stuff? Yep. Oh, the cerebral hemispheres, there's right and left separated by the, um, the longitudinal fissure. We already discussed that in lab. That's a good question as well. And the longitudinal fissure, you have your left brain and your right brain, and of course there's going to be a dominant side, okay? And, um, you know, uh, and remember the decussation of fibers. If your dominant side is left, you'll be right-handed and right-left-handed. Now, remember the corpus callosum we talked about in laboratory? That's the part, let's show it. That's the part right above here, right here. See that white stuff? And it also goes into the gray in this area right here. But that's your corpus callosum. And that's really important because it integrates the two sides. And um, remember, you can't have artistry without some sort of, uh, um, you know, depth perception and some level of uh, m measuring or mathematical ability. And remember, I told you guys the story when you get into higher math, like your higher levels of uh, calculus and things like Boolean algebra and logic testing. Um, that stuff requires a little bit of artistry as well. Even medicine. Medicine is so complex, there, sometimes they even call it the medical arts because there's some, there's an art, artistry involved in it. Remember I mentioned Broca's and uh, Wernicke's? Let's look at this little part here. Broca's provide the motor instructions for written and uh, spoken communication. And we talked about Wernicke's uh, when we talked about my son regarding the initiation of speech. So think Broca's and Wernicke, think language, think speech, and they're in the vicinity of your uh, temporal lobe. The Broca's area is a little bit towards the anterior portion of, of the temporal lobe, and the Wernicke's is in the posterior. Let's look at that picture. So the Broca's area, you know, it's legally it's in here, but uh, it's associated, it's associated, uh, with your Wernicke's auditory and all in a line right here. But um, the question I would ask in class is what's Broca's and Wernicke's for? And you will tell me language, okay? Bo -bo -bo, motor, we went through, let's see. Okay, the diencephalon. That's just uh, um, um, you know um, the the lower section of um, that's underneath your cerebrum, right before the midbrain. So you have your thalamus and and hypothalamus. You need to know uh, 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 the location of those things. You also have underneath there a whole bunch of nerves and other things. And one of the other things that you have there is your optic chiasma. That's just, um, you know, um, the nerves from your um, cranial nerve two that come, that uh, meet from your brain to your eyeball. Um, let's see. So, what's the thalamus? Right here it says, relay sensory information. So, we already talked about that in class, that uh, 
your brain has to pro your brain processes a ton of information at any given time. But remember, we talked about in class that you are not um, like conscious of every single action potential that goes through your uh, sensory, and your thalamus provides uh, kind of like a relay station. Now, um, there's pathways that connect the thalamus to the hypothalamus, and of course, the hypothalamus would be right underneath. And the way I remember hypothalamus, I think hypothalamus homeostasis. And that's heart rate, uh, blood pressure, body temperature, uh, you know, uh, all the things that keep us where. All your vital signs that keep you where in the middle. So that's your hypothalamus. So your thalamus, think sensory uh, regulation. Hypothalamus, think homeostasis, classic examples, heart rate, um, uh, blood pressure, body temp, uh, water and electrolyte balance, those things. Okay. Uh, the champ, so sad. To so sad to see what Parkinson's did to that guy. All right, moving on. Mm, what do you need to know about inside the brainstem? So, of course, brainstem, and as part of your midbrain, it's going to connect what? Your brain to the spinal cord, and hence the term midbrain. It's the, the, the area in between. Now, what's important about all that area is, if you look, and that's your optic chiasm that goes into your cranial nerve uh, uh, two, which is uh, optic nerve, you could see all these uh, nerves here, they're all very important and they're at the base of your brain and those are your cranial nerves, okay? So um, we already know the importance of our cranial nerves if you did um, the homework assignment of the cranial nerve. Uh, is it motor, and sen motor, sensory, or both? And what is the function of the cranial nerve? Now, what does the pons do? Pons, of course, is uh, midbrain. That's that. See this part. See this part right here where it's bulging out right there? Let's see a better picture of it. Here you go. So you have the midbrain connecting what? All the cerebrum, all this stuff here. And it's a way station of signals. And then you have your pons and then your medulla oblongata, and then further down, of course, is your spinal cord. So this little bump is what we're gonna be talking about right now. And that's your pons. So what does it do? All right. Now those are fibers, and of course, again, midbrain, they're a way station in between, it goes in between things, right? Um, so that, um, and when they say the word like nuclei and things like that, it just means a whole bunch of um, nerve cells. Now the medulla oblongata is very important because um, that's, uh, that has a lot to do with um, controlling our breathing, right? And uh, the pons, of course, without that connection to the higher centers and then to the medulla, then we're gonna have a problem. And whoever built us, built us perfect. They put all of that stuff in the middle. So if I ask Pons, uh, know where it is, right? And know that it's part of your midbrain, know that it's, um, you know, um, the, the in-between fibers. Medulla oblongata, know where that is, that's right before uh, your spinal cord, and think breathing, okay? Mm, and of course, what's going to go through there? Ascending and descending fibers. Ascending sensory, descending. Um, now, another thing that uh, it has in the medulla oblongata is reflex centers. And remember we talked about reflex and the interneurons? These are things that do not involve my brain. So we know about the autonomic system. I cannot control my blood pressure by, you know, doing Jedi mind trick, like, you know, um, you know, trying to, like, I can't say, hey, blood pressure, drop. Hey, like, if I'm, uh, 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 if I'm scared, hey, stop breathing fast. I can't tell my heart, hey, stop, uh, stop beating uh, fast. 
right? Those are part, of, part and parcel of your autonomic nervous system. And the medulla oblongata, right, not only does respiratory center think also what? Because remember, lungs and heart are cousins. I want you to think vasomotor center, meaning your blood pressure, right? And the cardiac center, meaning, of course, your heart. So the medulla oblongata also has ascending and descending fibers, but you have three main centers in it that control your heart, blood pressure, and respiratory. Doesn't that look like a beautiful all of the above? Doesn't that look like a beautiful identification? And remember, the pons is, um, is intimately connected to it, but I want you to think pons, I want you to think what? Like in be go between, between the higher centers and these centers. And they call these sometimes the lower centers of your brain because these are automatic. Uh, you don't think about them, and you shouldn't think about them. Now, th I believe this is one of the questions on your lab. It asks you about the sleep-wake cycle. It's here. When they're talking about sleep. And it's your reticular formation or your, uh, um, um, your I forgot what it's called, RAS, reticulation activating center. Oh, here it is, RAS, your reticular activating system. Your RAS, that's your sleep-wake cycle. And also, that's also kind of related to your pineal gland, which tells you if it's day or night. Okay, so all of them are uh, all connected. And you should know where they are. Um, do, 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 do. Types of sleep, nice to know. There's st ser several stages, but uh, the stage that we're most concerned about is REM, or rapid eye movement stage. I think it's stage four or three, I forgot. Well, what's important about uh, REM stage is that is the only time your brain actually gets to sit and organize things, right? When you're awake, your brain doesn't organize things very well because it's, it's too busy taking in all the sensory, it's too busy uh, telling your motor what to do, but when you're asleep, everything gets, everything gets now focused on the organization of all the data that you have in your, uh, in your brain. And that's why I always state that it do not do all-nighters because it's detrimental to uh, your short to long-term storage of memory and it's detrimental because it won't, um, um, it won't, um, uh, you won't have time to organize. And it takes at least like, I forgot, like two, three hours to reach REM uh, or re reach that deep sleep. And uh, take a look at you, maybe your kids and maybe your partner. Take a look at them when they're really dead asleep. Look at their eyeballs. They're moving, their eyeballs start moving around, and that's why they call it REM. And if you don't sleep regularly, uh, it causes a lot of problems. It even causes cardiovascular problems. It will definitely cause stress. And um, those of you who have ever stayed up uh, past three or four days, it, you start going into the realm of um, uh, uh, psychosis, which is abnormal condition of the mind. In class, uh, I think I, I, I talked about uh, me and my cousin Shane went hunting and we got lost. We got lost for days and we didn't bring food. By like the third day, we were loopy. Uh, and remember, you're not you when, um, when you don't eat, and also you're definitely not you when you don't get your REM sleep. Now your cerebellum, okay? Um, oh, if you're doing a uh, nervous system, hey, you wanna know your disorders? They're right here. Here's some nice disorders you could do. And these are disorders that deal with sleep. Um, Your cerebellum, also known as the arbor vitae, because you know it looks like a, a, a like a tree. Okay, so what's important? This is of course your cerebellum. This is the arbor vitae, and let me find the now. Integration and analyzation of uh, all the stuff that goes into the pons and medulla oblongata. So 
we already know that the mandula amamgata is, is vital for breathing, blood pressure, and cardiac. Well, uh, there are some textbooks that say this is both. You know, medulla oblongata does both. Um, but um, what does it do? Let's see. I'm, I'm trying to do. I'm trying to pick your, pick something that's that that's like basic. Well, what it basically does is again. Since if you know that the midbrain and the paws are just way stations, well, um, that means means like what? Like a train station. Signals go in and out, right? But what the cerebellum does is that it takes these um, these uh, signals, and all a lot of them are um, like visceral and autonomic. There's stuff. There's stuff, especially the sensory portion of it. There's stuff that that and whoever built this put these important structures very deep in, um, in our cranium uh, for protection. So let's look at some of the things that the textbook says. Coordination of skeletal muscle, right? Like when you're, when you're sitting up, are you, are you focused on your posture? And we already talked about that. No, you just sit up. But if I remove any consciousness from you, like a hammer to the head, or I knock you out with uh, sleepy pills, then what happens to that posture? It goes away. Um, knowing where you are, and that's called proprioception. Um, you know, uh, we kind of touched on proprioception when we talked about in lab that if I close my eyes and move my head to the left, I still know my head is to the left and not upright. So it, think of the cerebellum as integration of, cell, uh, of sensory information going back and forth, and you could see here, uh, back and forth to the ponds. Okay. And that's the cerebellum right here, that bump in the back. And when you look at it in a uh, uh, mid sagittal section, it looks like a little tree, hence the term arbor vitae. Love saying that. So, what are these spinal nerves? Remember the spinal nerves from our question in. Does it belong to the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system? Remember, the central nervous system, only think brain and spinal cord. But when you look here, you have these spinal nerves that are going to come out of this spinal cord. Let's look at a little bit cooler picture. And we looked at those dermatomes in, uh, in laboratory on where it goes, uh, what areas of the body did it get uh, uh, affected? So what's a spinal, that's a nice picture. Now we looked at this, this is the spinal cord and you could see the white matter is on the outside, the gray matter is on the inside. And what's coming out of it are spinal nerves. Your spinal nerves are not, I repeat, they are not part of your central nervous system. Your cranial nerves are not part of your central nervous system. The only two things that are part of your central nervous system is your brain and spinal cord, end of list, okay? And you have dorsal and ventral roots. We're gonna talk a little bit more about which one's sensory, which one's, um, uh, which one's motor. So that's what a uh, spinal nerve is. And then the spinal nerve spreads out from the spinal cord to certain sections. And if you recall the laboratory, we looked at uh, dermatomes. This is what we saw in lab. Here you go. Remember we saw this in laboratory? Like uh, cranial nerve two affected all of this stuff up there and then five, six, seven, and uh, we also talked about the thoracic will be all here. And um, looking at the posterior section here, remember sacral two, three, and four were uh, near your anus and your buttocks. Buttocks, that's also another word I like, like to say. Okay? Again, don't memorize this, just know and understand that um, these cranial nerves are numbered 
and it's cranial nerve one through eight for your seven uh, cervical uh, vertebrae, and then T1 through 12, and then your lumbar, uh, lumbar one through five, and sacral one through four. Okay, and you can see, uh, you know, that they spread out and they cover certain areas of your skin uh, regarding both sensory and motor, and hence the term dermatomes, dermat meaning skin. And of course, we already know this. You have to have some sort of receptor. Then it uh, goes up your spinal cord, which is uh, part of your central nervous system, in your brain to get processed, and then it goes back down your spinal cord. This is another view, another classic example of a reflex. If you see, like, uh, like for example, uh, you get scared or you get cold. Let's say I, I told you a creepy story about how, you know, It the Clown was uh, living in my basement for a while when I was a kid. Right? That might creep you out. So what will that happen? You have, you have the thought and you have the sensory, right? Or you sense that you're cold, right? It goes up the spinal uh, nerve. Then it goes into the interneuron at the spinal cord. Does it go up to the brain yet? Nope. Because there's a reflex. It'll happen automatically and it does not involve the brain. So interneuron, think where? Spinal cord. You have your ascending fiber, sensory, and your descending fiber, or efferent, that's your motor. It goes to the effector muscle. And what's the muscle here? Your erector pili, and then you'll make your hair stand up. So those are the parts of your uh, reflex. You have your receptor. Then it goes to your spinal cord through the interneuron, and then it goes back to your descending fiber. And also, looky, looky here. Do you notice that the sensory fibers are posterior and uh, or dorsal, and your um, motor fibers are anterior? Does that look like a nice juicy question regarding your spinal cord? So if I hurt my spinal cord near the back, I'm gonna manifest sensory problems at whatever level that we talked about regarding the dermatomes. And if I hurt my, um, uh, my spinal cord in the front, guess what? Uh, I won't be able to have um, a motor signal go down. And you can see how clinically useful that is knowing the organization of your spinal cord. So you got your spinal cord, white matter on the outside, gray matter on the inside. You have your receptor right here, your skin receptor, right? And for light touch, it's got to be um, um, Meisner's, goes up here into your spinal cord, through your spinal nerve, posterior ramus, or the posterior section of it, deals with sensory, anterior deals with motor, and your interneuron here. This is a wonderful picture. And those are reflexes. And here's another picture of the patella reflex. What's the stimulus? I hit the patella. It stretches the, this tendon. Um, then it sends a message that, hey, your tendon is stretching, so why don't you do something about it, right? That means you're about to move. So it goes up uh, the dorsal root, and that will be sensory, interneuron, then through the um, uh, ventral root for efferent, and then into your um, quadricep muscles, and what do they do? They'll contract, and then you'll do what? You will kick. Now, do you notice that how many pathways there are regarding this reflex? So what does that mean to you? It's going to come out. Know what ascending tracts and descending tracts are. Know what ventral tracts and dorsal tracts are. Know what your, where the location of your spinal nerve and how they enter and exit. You can see the coordination between sensory and motor. You ever like sit crisscross applesauce, right? And then you get paresthesias or pins and needles on your feet. You can't feel your feet too well. So how well do you walk? Not very. There you go. Posterior columns. Don't have to memorize this. This is for future training. But you know that what? Uh, posterior or dorsal columns, think sensory. Um, the vent uh, ventral thing, I mean, uh, ventral or anterior. Part, columns think um, uh, motor.
cortical spinal tract, rubrospinal, eh, nice to know. Eh, wouldn't test you on it. And here's the pathway. If I have uh, my sensory, which is my ascending, and you could see it going up, right? And you could see how it goes up. It goes up here, and it's through uh, the dorsal, and it comes up, up, up. And then there's processing in area one, two, three, then it sends the message down, down, down. And you can see how the thalamus is like a way station. Midbrain, also a way station, meaning signals have to pass through there. We already talked about what kind of nerves uh, connect to skeletal muscle, or uh, is motor nerves, and what kind of nerves uh, connect to receptors, sensory. And we already know from the cranial nerves that some of them are mixed. There are some that do both, like the, like the nerves to your tongue. It does both things. I have to have motor so I can speak. I also have to have sensory so I, I can taste the lovely fat and sugar that awaits me for lunch. Um, here's another uh, nice view of uh, your nerve. And it has, doesn't it look just like a muscle? It has a fascicle, a perineurium, an endoneurium. And know your nodes of Ranvier that doesn't have any myelin and that helps in saltatory conduction, which was on the quiz, that makes the action potential faster because it jumps. That's why we need this myelin. I could also now ask you, what's the outer covering? Epineurium. It goes, what, it co it goes, what covers the fascicle? Perineurium. On what covers the very inside, uh, the endoneurium. And what's the spaces in between myelin that have n uh, that don't have myelin and that that can uh, conduct saltatory conduction nodes of Ranvier. Who makes myelin in the peripheral nervous system? It's the Schwann cell. In the central nervous system, it's the oligodendrocyte. That's a nice question. Cranial nerves. Let's see. The best thing regarding cranial nerves is the chart. The chart that you guys made let's see I'm multitasking I should not do that. See these uh, chart and what was what was the one Ab abducens that's what I forgot yesterday in lab it was killing me I had to look that up. So Cranial nerves are labeled one, two, three in Roman numerals, as you see here, four, five, six. And the best way to do it, and they're all in what? The base of the brain, very important. They're intimate with uh, the midbrain and the inferior surface of your brain, uh, midbrain and pond. So all of this, uh, we, used to, we used to call it the elephant trunk or the tree trunk in medical school. But the best way to go through all this, you can go through all of this, but let's just go through this. This is the best way, and there's this thing, um, uh, mnemonic for cranial nerves. Wait, I don't know how to spell. Mnemonic is spelled with an M. So, uh, I remember it was on old Olympic something something, but let's here's here's one. And what's a mnemonic? It's like a saying that you can remember. So only one of the two athletes felt very good, victorious, and healthy. So olfactory, optic, ocular motor, trochlear, trigeminal, abducens for athletes. And you see how it matches the first letter, right? Um, uh, felt very good, uh, victorious, and healthy. Right, so there are 12 of them, okay? So look up, and, then go, uh, and also to remember which one's sensory, which one's both, 
right? But for me, I try to, um, I use uh, common sense. Uh, so, of course, olfactory and optic has got to be sensory, right? Ocular motor uh, has, to, uh, has to be motor. I told you three, four, and six uh, control your eyeball, so they have to be motor, right? Uh, facial has to be both. I have to be able to control my face. Trigeminal, I forgot how to remember that. Uh, your vestibular cochlea, we know that's what? Two things, your hearing and your balance, so that's sensory. I told you glossopharyngeal has to be both because of my tongue. Vagus is one of those, all of the above nerves, uh, so that's gotta be both. And of course, um, accessories, motor, hypoglossal is motor. Um, so whichever way you do it, but me personally, I like just quizzing myself and looking at this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And remember, three, four, and six, right? They're primarily motor. I want you to think what? Eyeballs. Remember the lateral rectus, superior rectus, uh, those muscles that move your eyeballs together. So let's go through the other ones. Olfactory is easy, right? Not easy, but straightforward. That's sensory. That's olfactory means sense of smell. So could you take this and just make it easier? Olfactory, sensory, smell. Optic, sensory, vision. Ocular, three, four, and six. All motor, and I'll write for three, four, and six, eyeball, eyeball, eyeball. Now, four is trochlear, okay? So that's motor. And, uh, oh, no, I already talked about three, four, six. I mean, five, trigeminal is mixed. So what does that mean? Uh, let's see, surface of the eyes, sensory uh, uh, upper teeth, sensory fibers along the scalp and teeth. Uh, think uh, all the stuff's near my face. So think trigeminal is near my face. It's uh, both, right? You have sensory fibers to my face and my teeth and I have motor fibers to muscles of mastication. So trigeminal, mixed, both. So what do you do with your face? I feel stuff on my face, I, goes, uh, I see stuff, because I have an ophthalmic division, so I see stuff in my eyes, and then lastly, I chew. So learn that story, that's trigeminal five. We already went through three, four, and six. Seven is facial, that's also mixed because I got sensory to, um, uh, to, uh, for, for taste, and I have motor for facial expression. That's easy. Eight, we already went over, that's sensory. Think two things, equilibrium, hearing. So when you make your own chart, do you need all these extra words, vestibular branch, cochlear? No, hearing, equilibrium. Doesn't eight look like a beautiful both A and B question? Nine, glossopharyngeal, remember the story about your tongue, right? Vegas. Now, Vegas is funny, right? Um, they have speech and swallowing. It's both. And also impulses of pharynx, larynx, and esophagus, and viscera. Uh, vagus is also uh, indirectly connected to your heart. You'll learn that in your EKG class. So Mixed both, I um, don't know how to memorize that. Um, you figure something out. Um, but um, I always think, it goes, I always think um, both, and you know, pharynx, larynx, esophagus, viscera, viscera and then somatic would be uh, speech and swallowing, and they're all kind of related, right? You swallow through your what? Your throat, your esophagus. So that's one way to look at it. Think esophagus, um, uh, um, think I have to have sensory fibers before the food hits my food tube and then I have to have motor to have peristalsis for my food tube. So that's mixed, that's your vagus nerve. 11, which is uh, um, motor, right? And uh, I want you to think uh, um, accessory, anything that's extra. Um, I always think uh, things that are extra in my neck and it's what motor. And of course, hypoglossal, underneath my tongue, underneath my tongue, there's a whole bunch of muscles there and that moves my tongue underneath it, right? But don't get that confused with glossopharyngeal, which is mixed, which is of course what? Motor fibers, salivary gland, swallowing, similar to your vagus, okay? 
So this chart, golden, but simplify it. Make it easier to make it easier to remember. And of course, quiz yourself daily. So by the time exam rolls around, you know what's you know what's what. Here's another better picture. Remember, I talked about your cranial nerves. You have seven vertebrae, but you have eight cranial nerves here. So I could ask a generalized question: Which cranial nerve is in your neck? And you'll tell me cervical. Which cranial nerve is associated with your uh, with your ribs? Uh, you know, uh, it's your thoracic. Which cranial nerve is uh, associated with your lower back? Of course, lumbar. Then you have, uh, I could even ask because we mentioned it on, um, in laboratory, which cranial nerves are uh, related to, you know, your buttocks, your um, anal sphincter, everything in your genitalia area. That's S2 through S4, so think what? Sacral. It's the worst I'll do to you. And the very, very bottom is, of course, you have your coccygeal nerve really on the end. Here's another example of dermatomes, anterior and posterior. And you could see S2, S3, S4, you see them all? Genitalia, uh, anus, and buttocks region. I always think of uh, Forrest Gump on buttocks, in the buttocks. Um, we already saw this uh, uh, picture. Mm. Right? I don't need you to know where exact nerves connect to what. That's for future training. But again, cervical. Uh, oh, what's a plexus? And I mentioned plexus is just like um, um, a, um, like a, a network. So remember I told you, like, if you cut your underarm for whatever reason, you have, you have a whole bunch of nerves under there? That's your brachial plexus. So... You cut that, C5 to T1, it's not gonna move anymore. You won't be able to feel, feel anymore. And you could see what it does. I cut that, look at all this. Your radial and ulnar nerve are now gone. So can you move your arm? Can you move your hands? Nope, the brachial plexus, you cut that. Whoever invented these horrible things to do to each other, pretty smart. Now, uh, your viscera, here you go. This is another drawing of your viscera. Again, to highlight your, uh, now you see the word ganglion? That just means it's like a group of nerves that got clumped together. Um, so of course the sensory would be what? The dorsal or posterior section of your spinal cord and your uh, motor will be the uh, ventral or anterior section. And of course reflexes, especially like in your gut um, they are um, uh, they are conducted through interneurons, and that is in the level of your spinal cord. We already went over that. How many times? So what does that say to you? It's kind of important. Sympathetic versus parasympathetic. Um, this is this is to me is too complicated. Why memorize all this when you could just do? Like uh, like one of these charts. Here you go. No, I don't want to sign up. So. And I know I did it on the board the other way, but sympathetic, I want you to think, what happens if I'm running away from somebody? So, of course, your ego's you're going to sweat. Of course, everything's going to be dilate, dilated. So don't sit and try to memorize all of these. It goes, what are you going to do? Just think of what happens when you're in a fight or flight situation. Sympathetic. And the big m ones are what? Pupil dilatation, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure. Okay? And then everything else has to shut down. Because remember the story I told you about my friend Johnny? Right? Johnny Fenson got hungry, and which is odd. You don't get hungry when you're in a fight. What the heck is, why are they doing this to me? I just want this chart. But when you're thinking of the parasympathetic, everything's the exact opposite. No one side and no, uh, um, what's the other? 
And if you can see, the autonomic nervous system is, of course, an offshoot of your central nervous system, and you can't control it. What's the part of uh, the offshoot of the central nervous system that you can control? And that's your somatic nervous system, and I believe that was on um, yesterday's quiz. So think soma, body, skeletal muscle. But when you're thinking sympathetic, parasympathetic, you think of the other two muscles, cardiac and visceral. Okay? That's the worst I could do to you. And you could see, it's never both. It's either one or the other. So do you have to memorize this chart? You have to memorize this? No. Just know and understand what sympathetic fight or flight, parasympathetic feed or breed. Memorize one side like that your life depended on it, and the other one is simply the other one. Autonomic neurotransmitters. I didn't ask that question, didn't want to confuse anybody. But skeletal muscle neurotransmitter is acetylcholine, period. Autonomic neurotransmitters for visceral muscle is what? Norepi, N-E, norepinephrine, and, uh, and acetylcholine. So it's both, okay? I repeat, autonomic neurotransmitters for smooth slash visceral muscle is both acetylcholine and norepinephrine, okay? Um, okay, we're at the end. So we got to talk about uh, what happens when you get older. Um, um, well, lifespan changes. What happens? So remember what I told you about myelination begins to form when you're 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 an infant, and then. Um, the pathways in your brain kind of semi-solidify by the time you're six years old. So ramp up anything you have with your kids. Uh, always ramp it up, even past six years old. But the majority of a lot of the brain processes, um, that's why infants and toddlers, are, they're, they're so precious to us um, because um, of their learning potential. But what happens? By the time you get to midlife, what happens? Because you can no longer um, um, make any more neurons, and you will start losing them, and about 10%. Now, you can diminish this 10% naturally, and I mentioned it in class. You chose a profession that requires your brain. I, I talked about in class how um, I asked the CNAs, or uh, certified nursing assistants in the room, hey, uh, have you ever seen a patient like who's non, not active, doesn't, um, doesn't uh, apply themselves socially in the, in the group home? What happens to their mental, uh, their mental state? It deteriorates a lot quicker than someone who's more active, who reads and who walks. So if you don't use it, you lose it. And uh, that's why I'm always talking about how study is a discipline. It should be daily. It should be like breathing because it will protect you. Um, I believe I relayed the story of my father when he uh, retired early in life. Um, fortunate for him, he made his money early in life and retired. I think he was my age, like uh, 53, 54, around there. Uh, um, well, when he was, by the time he was in his 60s, he was like a child because what did he do all day? He didn't do nothing all day. Um, he just like watched Jerry Springer and World Wrestling Federation. Um, so what happened to his brain? Now, let's talk about my mother uh, as the exact opposite. She had a job where it was all brains and all thinking and um, uh, even after she retired, she still uh, goes to continuing medical education. She still attends seminars. She's still sharp as a tack. And I see no personality changes. She's been her since the day I've known her as a child. But my father um, deteriorated socially and mentally and psychiatrically, psychologically, that's a better way to put it, uh, because of the lack of activity. 
So if you're waiting in line or something like that, why don't you go study something? Me, when I'm waiting in line or, uh, you know, um, waiting on something um, or waiting for somebody, mm, I open up, um, you know, uh, my puzzle games on my phone and I play word puzzle games and Sudoku type games because I want my brain to keep on doing what? Keep on processing. So if it, your brain keeps on processing, your brain's gonna say, well, I need these things, so it'll lose less and less, okay? Um, so neurotransmitters also decrease when you get older, and that also, um, uh, I've also noticed that as well over the years that um, the reflexes that I had when I was in my 20s and even in my 30s going into my 40s, they were pretty good, but now, I, I, um, I'm definitely much slower. Um, and of course, predisposition to depression and other diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. And the meaning of the word dementia is loss of memory. And remember, it could be a chemical thing or it could be a, um, um, uh, an electrical thing um, or both, okay? Um, and it's also due to genetics. So if you have that in your family, what you should be doing, you should start be talking to your, um, to your physician on prevent preventable measures. Uh, we already talked about eyesight. That's called uh, presbycusis. Um, let me spell it for you. Right, it's uh oh oh that's hearing, uh sorry my bad. Presbyopia. Opia, right? It's the gradual loss of your eyes or the ability to focus. And you see me do this every once in a while, right? And uh, we talked about the eyeball briefly in class, so you could see how the focused image directly lands on the, um, um, you know, the light rays land right on the retina, which is in the back here, right? But what happens when you get older? It starts, it doesn't focus. It goes behind here or sometimes it's out here. So it doesn't land right on the retina. And if it doesn't land on the retina, the vision isn't clear. But again, if you don't use it, you lose it. Um, and uh, uh, especially in your brain, uh, but in regarding your eyes, you use it, and especially you read a lot, you use it too much. Uh, there's potential detrimental factors. But, you know, you go to the ophthalmologist and you get your glasses and, uh, you know, do what you can. Okay? So that's chapter 11. Uh, uh, shoot me an email, any questions, comments, or recipes. And have a good day, everyone.